Hi everyone, welcome to the November-December 2021 LD Topic Analysis. My name is Joseph Barquin. I am a coach and a judge uh, in LD and in policy, and I'm also a contributor to myldcoach.com. So let's get analyzing for this topic. The topic is resolved. A just government ought to recognize an unconditional right of workers to strike. This is going to be a very wordy topic with a lot of controversies that need to be resolved uh, within the debate to figure out who will be getting a ballot. And you can't just like go into it without knowing sort of the history behind the topic and the definitions of what all this means so we can figure out where the debate really needs to end up, right? So quick summary of what this topic is probably going to be asking us before we delve into any hard literature bases. Uh, it's going to be centered on labor uh, and labor that is about resolving dehumanizing uh, practices by uh, employers, usually wages being too low, not having a healthy environment for them to work. Um, quotas that are basically unmeetable unless they overwork. A lot of conditions that that generally a strike will resolve when the employers will bargain with the workers uh, so that the workers can go back to work and employers can go back to making money, right? This is also an international topic because it doesn't specify any singular state it just says a just government this means that your advantages are not limited to just the u.s you can use many 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 countries to cite in your advantages uh, for both the affirmative and negative this is a very very good way uh, to research international labor practices and how different countries have decided to make labor laws centered around strikes this is also a very framework friendly topic because of the amount of people this topic affects, i.e. a vast majority of humanity works. Uh, so that means that their ability to do something, uh, to be humanized again, uh, is going to be debated on multiple moral grounds, right? Get ready for a lot of philosophies and definitions because this topic has a lot of moving definitions there's going to be a lot of debates about definitions don't get bogged down on definitions you have to understand the core controversies of what the topic is asking uh and if your debates just get into the definitions no one's going to have any fun your judges are not going to have any fun and they're not going to want to vote uh af or neg if it's just a definitions debate right so let's get straight into the definitions. A just government. This just gave you an easy value for the topic. Everyone's probably going to use justice as their value because justice is probably the easiest way to figure out whether a government is just or not. Uh, and a lot of philosophers have written about what it means for a government to be just. The one caveat is because this is a, a topic about labor law, your framing of justice should probably have some way uh, to be related to labor law. And there is a few authors that have written extensively about what it means for a labor law centered around striking uh, to be just, right? Um, and this is going to be very, very, very much up to the debater's discretion. There's not just a one size fits all uh, idea of what the value value criterion is when it comes to justice, i.e. you can use roles, right? Uh, Rawls has the idea of providing uh, for the least amount of for the least amount of individual or for the most amount of individuals with the least amount of power in society. There we go. Uh, and what that means, right? Usually the proletariat and the people in the global south have the least amount of political power um, and enjoy the least amount of society. So Rawls would probably be uh, attuning their affirmative to uh, those individuals. Consequentialism uh, then revolves around its justice to helping the greatest good for the greatest amount of people. And how you weigh that uh, through the cost-benefit analysis is going to be a core affirmative and a negative uh, idea for framework when it comes to like justice, right? Okay. So to recognize, this is a weird word 
because it means that you don't have to have a policy option, right? To recognize this, to just acknowledge something uh, or acknowledge an existence of something, i.e., you know, in April of this year, Biden recognized that in 1915, uh, the Armenian genocide happened in Turkey, right? And Turkey was very much not happy about that because they've been in denial of it and will continue to deny it uh, throughout its existence. Uh, but why was that important? Because it signaled an international commitment of the U.S. to care about human rights and specifically genocide of individuals and peoples, right? Uh, that can be important when it can have reverberating political effects on how different countries then deal with us. Uh, the passing of a law is also another way to recognize that a problem needs to be resolved, right? Uh, one of them was the American Disabilities Act of 1990, when the U.S. voted to make it into law that people with disabilities deserve the same rights as literally everyone else. So should workers have the same rights uh, as their employers? I don't know, right? Uh, but recognize means you don't have to defend an implementation, uh, which is good for chat debaters, but if you're in progressive land, recognize means you definitely should uh, pass a plan. Unconditional is going to be one of your biggest core controversial words in this debate. Uh, Merriam-Webster dictionary uh, defines unconditional as not conditional or limited i.e it should be without reserve that means there should be no conditions when it comes to workers being able to strike or not uh, this is where a lot of negative ground is going to be and this is also where a lot of affirmative ground is going to be uh, more on that later when we get to the specific affirmative and negatives in this topic right so right uh, the dictionary law defines right as an entitlement to something with this topic it is directly connected to the concept of justice when you have two words that are connected to justice and rights uh that means your entire af can be centered around the idea of human rights right uh means that the ability to strike is a built-in mechanism within just governments and you will be able to research a lot of countries that have built-in laws for workers to strike in accordance that is lawful and constitutional. A Japan has an entire section of their law that talks about how a union can and can, can, or, can or cannot organize uh, versus their employers uh, to resolve issues centered around labor, right? As well as Germany, as well as Turkey, as well as Israel. Basically, most countries have this built into their government. Um, and why and why not can you strike? Worker. This one is not going to be important in terms of your definition because everyone has a very general idea of what a worker is. But for the sake of this lecture, a worker is a person who labors in exchange for a wage or a commodity. Uh, the Guardian indicates that there are 3.2 billion people who work around the world with a few hundred million that are unemployed uh, this fluctuates given any time this was from five years ago so i'm pretty sure this has gone on higher uh, this pretty much means that because the number is so big when it comes to who is affected by strikes and that means that utilitarian calculus and consequentialism is going to be a very 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 big framework when it comes to the consequences of allowing unconditional strikes to be a thing to strike and this is where another core controversy is right law info indicates that workers may choose to protest unfair wages or other issues with their employers by going on strike during a strike workers do not provide any services to the company uh, Strikes have been a thing for basically the vast majority of human history. The first instance of a strike was in ancient Egypt when Ramses uh, refused to pay uh, laborers for something. And so they went on strike and eventually that was resolved. Uh, one of the major movements of strikes occurred during the Industrial Revolution as a vast majority of humanity uh, migrated to industrial centers. 
And what they found was the conditions were sort of really, really deplorable. The wages were really, really bad. And the protections that were afforded people back then were very much non-existent, right? They had to have many, many strikes to resolve a lot of issues. And in the process of striking, a lot of lives were lost and a lot of really interesting political tactics were used to suppress uh, strikes. Um, and that's going to be a major portion of you know, knowing the background of strikes and why they're sort of important. I.e., we wouldn't have an eight day or an eight hour workday without strikes. We wouldn't have the ability to create unions without strikes. We wouldn't have protections for workers with disabilities without strikes, etc., etc., etc. The history is rich. The history is important to know. And the history is something that still affects us to our modern day, i.e., during the 2018-2019 school season, uh, workers went on strike for a myriad of reasons, mostly because they were underpaid um, and they were not getting the benefits that they feel that they deserved, right? So there was a massive strike of teachers from multiple states that refused to work until they were resolved. And it was pretty successful. Um, and it's something that we still continue to see now when it comes to, you know, when it comes to our society, right? So what is the resolution asking us? Well, there are four things uh, that it's asking us that I feel, right? One is, should labor strikes be a human right? And if so, why? Right, remember in the, in the, in the topic, in the, in the topic itself, it says, uh, why it should be unconditional, why we can just do so. When you don't have a condition to something, it almost seems like it has to be a right. Plus also uh, the resolution says it should be a right, right? So this means that you can have an entire affirmative and negative debate about why strikes should or should not be a human right. This also means your frameworks around human rights uh, fit into this, right? The second one is I think also important because this is a core controversy about the affirmative and negative is should there be conditions in which strikes are not allowed i.e in many many different countries you may not strike unless you are part of a labor union that's a condition that limits when a or how a strike can form right why is that problematic and why is that bad i.e if you cannot form a labor union then what is going to fix the problems for the workers who are being exploited by their employers, right? This is something that uh, will be fun to research for both the affirmative and negative, i.e. you can defend a unionization uh, sort of stuff on the negative and you can be like why unions are not as effective as you think that they were because one, access to unions is very limited and two, even if you do get access to a union, there are limitations and the implementation of unions into politics depending on say the the countries that you're in right um and three are conditional strikes enough the affirmative will say no the negatives can say yes right uh up to you all on how you all want to resolve this but the negative probably wants to say like here are the specific countries that have conditional strikes and here are the success stories that they've had to prove why having an unconditional strike if you can find any case turns about why having an unreserved condition or unreserved uh, strikes as being problematic and lastly i think this is the least important thing because i don't think it's as important in tradland is is recognition enough i.e having the federal government of any single country that we feel is just to recognize something does that really do anything right just because the u.s recognizes that workers should have uh an unconditional right to strike does that mean that they're going to pass a law i don't think so but that's going to be the most irrelevant part or i guess the least relevant part to this topic for trad debaters because uh we're just arguing about whether or not you know strikes should be conditional or unconditional and if they should be a right or not a right 
those are going to be the two biggest questions and if one can resolve it and win their controversy then they can probably win a round right so let's talk about why do strikes need to be unconditional um, so a just government preserves the ability of peoples within it to have a life for their ability to live uh, meaningfully is not trampled upon uh, strikes that carry conditions can deter workers from trying to resolve issues with their employers, i.e. in Chile, right? If you are striking, you do not get any sort of social security benefits, uh, meaning that your employers don't have to pay you social security monthly benefits. Um, so that's always going to be in the back of your mind. The longer the strike goes on, the less benefits that you have. In Colombia, you also can't do this. Same thing with the U.S. and many other countries. And you also can't apply for unemployment in America if you are on strike. This means that there is a condition when you are striking at the back of your mind that you do not get paid. You are not getting paid. You are not working. You are not getting paid. The longer this goes on, the longer that you will not have any sustenance. And if your bank account cannot afford to, res to take the hit, you're going to be less likely to go on strike and endure the the conditions that you're having in the status quo right and so one of the affirmative things is why having conditions is a problematic thing in the status quo and why we need to end conditions to make it unconditional right so countries can also limit on how a strike can proceed which is something that i found really really interesting because i'm not like super deep into labor law but i found this part interesting as heck so in germany only trade unions can strike and only if it's going to be used in a collective bargaining agreement between the employees and employers i.e general strikes are a thing but it doesn't it's not really like like as powerful same thing in turkey uh and in turkey 10 percent of employees of that sector must be in the trade union for them to collectively bargain i.e if your trade union only encompasses 9.8 percent of the employees of that sector you don't get to have any collective bargaining power um and in japan the right to strike which is used uh, to break negotiations and resolve you know problems with employers uh, they need to be a constitutional union, i.e. they need to be independent uh, from their employer, right? Depending on the country, there are whys and hows on how or on the ability to strike. So a lot of the affirmative research and the negative research is going to be figuring out which model you find problematic and which model that you find uh, very good for your side I, if you are affirmative you may want to look at countries that have had uh, horrendous labor practices or labor results and why their associated labor laws have been failing and if you're negative you may want to find the opposite right uh, so the, let's say you want to strike but you can't unionize right because a lot of these countries only unions have the ability to strike so what do you do well if only unions have the ability to bargain with employers to resolve issues that means that you need to be able to make a union that's it if you can't make a union what do you do well you're powerless you're gonna have to go on a general strike and if your country does not want you to or there are laws that make it illegal uh, you are not going to enjoy any sort of freedoms for very long, right? So let's talk about a problem in America right now when it comes to one of the major, major uh, industri well, industrial powers, uh, i.e. Amazon, and how they've been able to prevent unions from being made, i.e. in 2021, there was an article that was published at the New York Times that really spelled out the history in which Amazon has attempted to and has been very successful to thwart the ability of unions to be created so that they could bargain uh, for better conditions, 
right? Some of them would be going into a meeting with organizers where they'll acknowledge that things need to be better for the future, but they won't actually do anything in the long run, and then people forget about it. Another part of it is they'll employ FBI under well, retired agents uh, to work in their companies to to uh, antagonize the organizers and the workers of the companies so that they don't uh, vote or that they become in opposition of it, right? Which is problematic because as we know in the news, a lot of Amazon workers are one, overworked because they need to meet specific quotas, even as like delivery drivers. If you don't meet your quota, you're probably going to get fired even though like you're working way more than you need to. Uh, unsafe environments there is a part of this report that indicated that you know some of these warehouse workers were working in warehouses without decent ventilation and i think it was in 2011 or 2013 where uh emergency services had in to be called uh because people were were in need of medical attention from heat waves right if that's that's problematic but like ac is expensive so what do you do? Well, if you don't have to give them AC and you let the emergency services take care of it, then you are off the hook having to pay as mi however much it takes to put the AC in as well as run it year round, right? Um, during the coronavirus, when it first hit, uh, Amazon workers were not afforded personal uh, protection uh, masks. And that became problematic when a lot of uh, employees caught COVID and because the vaccine still wasn't a thing, there was no way to resolve the issues for them other than get them more protection, right? And because there was no legal union, or there was no union at all, to help to help fix these conditions, uh, it's always been at the discretion of public opinion and public backlash when it comes to Amazon. And you know what? Money trumps everything, so we'll see, right? And so if you can't get a union, how are you going to resolve things that unions can fix, i.e. if you're going to be using why conditions are bad, you may want to have like unions are not enough built into the advantage of the affirmative. So let's talk about affirmative and the negative here. Um, just like the federal jobs guarantee topic from 2020, the ground for this topic will be very AF-centric, I feel, for LD debaters. The the debates that I've been able to coach uh, from last year were very AF-centric, minus the random counterplan rounds that were allowed at state-level uh, competitions. Right. This means that you get access to a bunch of frameworks because this affects a lot of people and because there's moral intent behind it and who it affects. It, you get access to roles. You get... Uh, Kant's uh, stuff, I don't, I'm not the biggest fan of Kant. Uh, you get access to Kant's Quagilism, you get access to Hobbes and Locke, uh, Locke uh, in their uh, in their philosophies, and you get to use like even libertarianism on the AF and the NAG uh, on this topic, right? Uh, advantages can be, there's a lot of advantages, right? On why seeing strikes as a human right is important uh, to, resolving wages in the status quo, um, and why unconditional strikes are sort of important for them. So here's a couple of examples of affirmatives. The first one is using the value of justice, because most affirmatives probably should use justice, right? The value criterion is consequentialism. And here are a few advantage examples that you can use uh, for your affirmative when it comes to consequentialism, right? One would be an attack on unions about why uh, unions themselves can be corrupted, as well as the difficulty in establishing unions in uh, countries that make it politically very difficult to establish a union, i.e. Uh, giant corporations in the U.S. as well as many other countries abroad, i.e. depending on your labor laws in a country, it may be difficult, if not impossible, to create a union, whereas in other countries it can be, right? It can be very good. Uh, conditions, i.e. what we talked about earlier, about why having conditions attached uh, when it comes to being able to strike might be problematic and would make it difficult to resolve uh, unfair wages, i.e. the percentage of that can be represented in a union in order to be able to strike uh, could be detrimental 
right, and how many workers would be affected in those sorts of situations. Um, the ability of governments to control right conditions to make unfavorable labor laws uh, when the employee or employers that make billions of dollars pressure them with lobby groups and how little it affects you know a myriad of citizens uh, around the world um, and then you can go to a very very generic idea of like human rights and why it's important and how many people are not afforded human rights and why striking would be a reaffirmation of human rights to those uh, people uh, can be seen in a consequentialist manner, right? You don't get access to any giant nuclear wars. This will be about body count in terms of the effects of your recognition um, and why we need to recognize in terms of the effective affected uh, individuals uh, in the world, right? The second one is Rawls. I think this is probably my more... F I like this, not just because I like writing soft left Fs in progressive, but I think that uh, this has a lot of ground that also works within consequentialism, right? Uh, the value will be justice. The value criterion is the differential principle, which is uh, part and parcel to what Rawls likes to use. Uh, workers make up a majority of the least uh, empowered in society, i.e. if you look at the amount of wages workers have, uh, in terms of the global south, they're not very good, right? In comparison to the global north, and why having the ability to unconditionally strike would be able to resolve some of those issues, uh, the problems that a lot of global south uh, countries face is the low wages. One again, uh, lack of a decent work environment, right? Uh, lack of protections, uh, or in, yeah, protections in those environments, i.e., having healthcare. Uh, provided to you as well other services that we are enjoying the global north but the global south does not as well as like abusive policies by employers to exploit uh the global south where they don't have any bargaining power to resolve anything right uh unconditional strikes would be a way to resolve a lot of this to make the playing field equal when it comes to bargaining versus the uh employer versus employee sort of uh difference in power and why that would be very important uh, in debate space, right? Or to be able to debate about. Uh, this, I think, it works. It can fit under a consequentialism neg uh, and be able to beat it. I also feel that Rawls, in terms of what they defend, is pretty decent on this topic. Right? There's a lot more. You can use Kantian uh, uh, virtue ethics about why having conditions creates you know coercion towards uh towards the workers and that's problematic so having it be unconditional removes it uh also goes nag because because it also goes nag right a lot of philosophers go af and neg in this uh topic which is pretty cool right so let's talk about the framework on the negative uh basically the same thing right it's up to you as to what you want to defend in this debate and what advantages you want to build on the negative side or what case you want to build on the negative side and how you want to attack the affirmative uh again you can use consequentialism and defend you know current models that have been pretty effective that are conditional you can defend Kant and why making it unconditional allows uh uh allows coercion going the other way towards the employers, which I'm eh, not the biggest fan. Uh, libertarianism also, when the governments recognize this and make it into law, uh, is giant, giant government meddling into the private sphere, probably should not allow them to, right? Libertarianism goes af and neg in this topic as well. Uh, negatives, there are certain things that all negatives, well, some negatives should and should not say. Uh, one, the idea of unconditional strikes is easily corruptible by political agendas, right? What we're seeing in America now is labor organizing in favor of anti-vaccine mandates uh, in a sphere where public uh, policies are being made for vaccine mandates. This does not affect their ability to work in an unfair manner. It affects different things, but people are using... Uh, those sorts of tactics built into the strike system to be able to uh, change the political process of strikes means that 
the process of strikes can be very, very politically cha charged uh, post-affirmative that may make it problematic uh, in the future, right? Uh, this is, the number two is like the fourth on the controversy list. I forgot why I had a number two, but it's on number two. Uh, why recognizing literally doesn't mean anything. Uh, it's just empty words. We like to call this cruel optimism uh, where, oh, we are gonna create a change, but nothing, right? Um, i.e. the Armenian genocide happened, we recognized it, where did we implement any policies internationally or nationally? Uh, no, right? Uh, the third one is probably core neg ground, i.e. conditional strikes are good, and here are the countries that have conditional strikes, and here is why unconditional strikes are probably problematic, right? This goes in conjunction with number four, uh, defend a specific model of strikes, that you feel is good versus the affirmative uh, that can challenge them. And finally, if you have a league that allows counter plans to be had, uh, there are some pretty interesting counter plans that you can use versus affirmative, i.e. one is a UBI if you give them a universal basic income uh, that resolves a good chunk of what affirmatives will be complaining about, which is unfair wages. Um, if you make mandatory unions a thing that resolves a problem with like unions not being able to be accessible, right? Uh, if you make minimum wage laws be a thing, that means that it also resolves the idea of like low wages, etc. There's a ton of good counter plan ground for this topic that deal with the process of the affirmative as well as like the advantage areas of the affirmative. But again, league rules are very different between one state and the other. So I wouldn't give my hopes up. The one cool thing is technically, when you're defending the status quo model of a conditional uh, conditional strike when it comes to labor, that's technically a, that's pretty close to a counter plan. You're basically running it as a counter plan, except you're defending the status quo, right? Which works. And you don't have to defend any sort of like counter plan theory. You're just saying no, having it be unconditional yeah, is problematic, right? So strict strats. Uh, this is going to be a very, very fun debate, but you all need to make sure to weigh your impacts. Um, I have a lot of rounds where I don't know why I'm voting affirmative or negative because I don't know what I'm comparing at the end of the round, right? Who's gonna be affected by this stuff and why Why is looking at them uh, sort of really, really important versus the other side, right? Number two is if the other side's advantage goes away if you win the framework debate, Use that as probably one of your inroads to the ballot. Uh, this is something that can be very strategic. If you do, say, uh, Kantian, Kantian virtue ethics on the affirmative, and then it goes pure consequentialism, well, if you don't get access to consequentialism because of Kant, then they need to win a case term. But if all their cases are talking about consequentialism that results from, say, the affirmative, do we even look at it? No, right? And then you'll be able to tell the judge why, right? Uh, you don't have to defend implementation of a policy, but defending and attacking a model of why your affirmative or negative is good and beginning, beginning it in the cross sex after the first affirmative speech is probably going to win you a lot of, uh, persuasion because this is a very detail oriented topic. The more you know about it and the more you convince your judge that you know what you're talking about, the better your results will go, right? Uh, number four, this goes along with it. Tell a story. This is a very, very deep topic when it comes to a lot of detail centered around one specific area, right? Don't get lost in the detail. Don't get lost in the soup. Like, remember that if your judge is overloaded with a lot of information, statistics, and just like stuff, um, and the impact story, i.e. what happens to little Timmy uh, and their family, then no one's gonna have a really good ballot at the end of the round, and it's going to make the life of the judge difficult, right? And finally, just have fun, right? This is going to be the topic for the next couple of months. It's going to be very, very deep. Do your best in the rounds with the research that you have. Um, don't try to overthink it. You're not trying to solve world hunger, right? This is the only thing that I can really ask of you all, right? Have fun, go debate, learn something, and see see what happens. And that's it, this concludes the video. If you'd like more progressive analysis of the topic, uh, tune into the other YouTube videos on myldcoach.com. There should be a couple of them that are going to be coming up if you're in progressive land that you can take a look at. Thank you very much and have a nice day.